Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Good evening and welcome to Book Club Girl on Air, a Blog Talk radio show brought to you by BookClubGirl.com, a blog dedicated to sharing great books, news, and tips with Book Club Girls everywhere. I'm Mary Sasso, and tonight's guest is number one New York Times bestselling author Meg Cabot. Meg is the bestselling author of dozens of books for adults, teens, and young readers, including the young adult fiction series The Princess Diaries, the recent teen novels Abandoned and Underworld, an adult series like Queen of Babel, The Boy Next Door, and what we're here to talk about tonight, the Heather Wells Mystery Series. Meg, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Great. We're excited to have you here. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone before we get started uh, that this is a live broadcast. So if you have any questions for Meg, please feel free to type them into the online chat room, and I'll do my best to relay them to her. You can also call in to 347-945-6149 if you'd like to ask Meg a question directly. If you didn't already know, we've been reading some of Meg Cabot's most beloved adult books as part of our Meg Cabot read-along this summer, including The Boy Next Door, Queen of Babel, and Size 12 is Not Fat, the first book in the wildly popular Heather Wells mystery series. Tonight, we're here to talk about Size 12 and Ready to Rock, the latest book in her series, which is now on sale wherever books are sold. I'm going to kick off the show with a brief synopsis of Size 12 and Ready to Rock, and then we'll move on to questions. Summer break and the living ain't easy. Just because the students at New York College have flown the coop doesn't mean assistant residence hall director Heather Wells can relax. Fisher Hall is busier than ever, filled with squealing 13 and 14 year old girls attending the first ever Tanya Trace Teen Rock Camp, hosted by pop sensation Tanya Trace herself, who just happens to be newly married to Heather's ex boyfriend, heartthrob Jordan Cartwright. But the real headache begins when the producer of a reality TV show starring Tanya winds up dead, and it's clear that the star was the intended victim. Grant Cartwright, head of Cartwright Records, wants to keep his daughter-in-law and his highest-earning performer alive. So he hires his oldest son, black sheep of the family, and private investigator Cooper Cartwright, who just happens to be Heather's new fiancé. Heather should leave the detecting to Cooper, but with a dorm full of hysterical mini divas in training, she can't help but get involved. And after Tanya shares a really shocking secret with her, this reality suddenly becomes more dangerous, dangerously real than anyone ever anticipated. Well, Meg, as I said earlier, it's great to have you on the show. Um, I have loved reading the Heather Wells books this summer, and it's, I'm really excited to talk to you about them in person. Well, thank you. I've had a great time being on a book tour for the latest book and uh, getting to see a lot of the readers, not all of them, because I was mainly in the Midwest. But um, it's been really exciting to go back out and talk about this uh, book series. I haven't written one in about five years, but only about three months has gone by chronologically in the books since the last one. So um, it's been really fun. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you get asked this question a lot, but I wanted to ask, ask you myself and, you know, for everyone listening in, why did you decide to write about a plus size heroine? Well, you know, I have been every size that there is um, from, well, I've never been size two or size zero or anything quite that small, but I really have been like a size 18 and certainly a size 12. So I know what it's like to go into a clothing store and uh, you know, see something really cute and go up to the salesperson and say, hey, you know, do you have, because they ever, of course, have it in the larger sizes. I don't know why that is, but it seems like most of the time when you go up and you say, hey, you only have this up to size 10. Do you have this, like, in a size 14 or 16? They're like, oh, no, the designer doesn't make it in sizes bigger than size 12. And the actual size of American women right now, 50% of women our size 14 or larger in America. And so it's really annoying that most retail 
places in America don't carry sizes 14 and up. So I just got really frustrated. And I was like, why is it that when we're reading books or going to the movies, we so rarely see characters who are our size. <laughs> They're always like size two or zero. And that seems like when we go to the store, that seems to be what the size of the clothes they have too. So I just wanted to write about somebody that I could relate to. Because the other thing that I always felt like too, um, when I started the series was that a lot of times when you do see a plus size character, and I don't like calling it plus size because to me that's just average size, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. they always lose the weight before they get the guy. And that doesn't right. seem right to me either because, uh, you know, I have a guy and I didn't lose weight to get the guy. So I wanted to write about a girl who stays the same size and she's healthy. I want to point out that she's, you know, she's healthy. She goes to the doctor. She's she's healthy. She's got, like, she doesn't have diabetes or anything like that. She's just a big girl. Um mm-hmm. But, you know, she doesn't lose the weight to get the guy. So I just wanted to write about somebody that, you know, was someone I could relate to and someone I've been. And um, obviously my weight goes up and down. I've had, I've worked in a dorm for a long time, so I ate a lot of ice cream because it was free. (laughs) And then, you know, I got to a point where I was like, I don't fit into my pants anymore. I want to go buy some cute pants, but they didn't have them in my size. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll, I'll lay off the ice cream for a little while. And then I, you know, got back into my pants. But, um... I just wanted to write about someone that I, I I was and am. Well, I think what's so, what I loved about Heather so much is that, you know, in Size 12 is Not Fat, she references how she's a size 12 and she's bigger than she used to be, but what she perceives her size to be is so different from what other people perceive it to be, especially when, mm-hmm. after, you know, reading Size 12 and Ready to Rock, like, you know, people think she's hot. Cooper th- thinks she's hot. She is hot. And yeah, exactly. And so much of it is, yeah, your attitude. Um, mm-hmm. But then, you know, you've got the you've got the media and a lot of people who kind of project this different kind of idea than than you yourself have. And you're like, what's going on? It's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And plus, you know, she worked for many years as a pop star um, when she was a teenager, and she was let go from that position when she started to get a little more womanly. So she kind of has been beat up on a little bit. Um, with the body image thing. And a lot of people do think the books are, are just about that. They think, oh, you know, because they have this title um, that has size in the title. But they're not. Actually, they're mysteries. They're murder mysteries. There's been mm-hmm. a, lot of, a, lot of, a little bit of violent crime in there. But they're, but they're also funny romances, too, because yeah. it's about Heather uh, getting out there after she's, she's become a woman and she's trying to find herself in the, in the real world um, and pursuing a new career now that she's no longer a teenager. And also, um, you know, trying to find maybe... Maybe the right guy. Yeah. And, of course, catch a murderer. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, I loved, I mean, I love mystery so much, and so I loved the mystery component of these books. Um, what do you like about writing the mysteries, and how is that writing process different from writing your other books? Well, I love mysteries, too, so I'm, I'm glad you said that. To me, um, whenever I have some free time, I always look for a good mystery to grab onto because I always think to, you know, like the purest form of, of fiction, besides romance, because I, I always want there to be a little romance in the book, too, because I always want to want to find the girl, you know, get the get the great guy. Um, but if there's a dead body or, some, you know, some kind of injustice that's been committed and they also have to find out, you know, who did that, I think that's great. And so to me, that's a perfect read. So I, I was so excited and when I was kind of coming up with this idea, and I worked in a dorm, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, This is what these books are kind of based on. And um, there were always weird little things happening. And and being a writer, of course, I would always use my imagination. I'd be like, oh, what if, you know, just somebody actually had been killed? Of course, nobody ever was. But in my imagination, I would always take it a little bit further than what had actually happened. And um, then there'd be a mystery, and I'd have to solve it, you know, like Angela Lansbury style from Murder, She Wrote. And um, my bosses were always like, oh, my God, you know, come on, stop it. But um, So I, I was just really excited to write just my own mystery series because I just loved so many when I was growing up. I loved Nancy Drew, obviously. And then as I got a little bit older, I loved to read my favorite mystery series, was, uh, the Spencer series. I don't know how many people ever watched Spencer for Hire, but I loved those books by Robert B. Parker um, because, you know, he has a little romance too. And um, mine are a little, gir- a little more girly. But um, to be able to have this central problem that the character has to solve, and it's the most – you know, heinous thing is that somebody has died and somebody has killed this person and, you know, she has to bring this person to justice. Um, that's To me, that's the crux of, of all fiction. You know, there is the biggest problem in the world. How are we going to get this person who's committed this crime um, and bring this person to justice? So 
that's my favorite kind of book to read. Um, of course, there's a little humor thrown in. And oh, yeah. I do love those shows on TV like Bones and um, mm-hmm. The Clothes or every every kind of show that's like that where there's a mystery to solve. But then there's also some humor and some romance. So I, I do try to write my books like that. Yeah. Um, Julie Peterson from our chat room, she runs the blog Booking Mama. She wants to ask you, what are the challenges you face in writing mysteries? Oh, well, first of all, hi, I love your website. Um, Second of all, the challenge is, of course, you want to write a mystery that no one has really, who reads mysteries is going to find too familiar. Because people who read mysteries, like myself, we've read them all. And so when we're reading it, we're trying to solve it in our head. And so, of course, we're like, oh, I've seen this one before. So some you have these different kinds of mysteries that you present. In in this one, size 12 and ready to rock, uh, we have... I don't want to give it away to anyone who's read it, but we do have a stalker. It's a stalker who is after someone. So the mystery is really, we kind of know who the person is, but how are they going to catch him? And why is he doing this? So, um, you know, you you want to lay out the clues for the characters to solve, but you don't want to make it too easy because you have these readers who are really, really smart. So, um, you know, but you yourself, the writer... (laughs) You know, you know who did it, and you kind of know why the person's doing it, but you also kind of don't – you want to trick yourself while you're writing it, too, because I, I have found that if I know the answers myself as I'm going along, I make it too easy for the reader. So I have to sometimes go back in after I've written it and take stuff out because mm-hmm. my editor will say, oh, my gosh, you know, I got this right away. So that right. is, that's one of the main tricky parts. Yeah. So there's a lot of rewriting involved. Yeah, there's a lot of rewriting, and there's a lot of, um, you know, you don't want to make it too easy for the reader because readers are really, they're really smart, especially mystery readers, because they've read a lot of them. And I'm including mm-hmm. myself because I've read a lot of them too. Yeah. And it's fun. It's fun to try to guess who the who who done it, you know. Right. That's part of it too. And I have a tendency sometimes to get a little too gory. I've been told <laughs> in the first draft so I, I put a little too much gore in, and my and my editor always says, "Okay, let's back off on the gore. We want to, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're, not, we're not writing a girl with the dragon tattoo here. <laughs> we, I mean, I, I that would just be a different kind. Of, and I love those too, but that's just a different kind of mystery. Um, so I want to, um, you know. I, I think I, there was one uh, Heather Wall's book where I put a head in a in a pot oh, yeah. <laughs> in the cafeteria, yeah, which actually happened not in my not in my dorm. It happened in New York City, and that was just a little, maybe a little too gory. I, I will admit, of course, that never actually really happens. But I always thought to myself, if I walked down in the cafeteria one day, and I, what would be the worst thing I could find? And and that was it. And you know, I did get some letters. <laughs> <laughs> that one for some readers. So I thought, oh, maybe, I don't know. We'll see what happens in the, in the next Heather Wells book, but I don't know if she'll be finding any more body parts. I did get, like, a, a resident one time came into my office and said, you know, Meg, there's a, there's a brain on the elevator. Oh and God. it was not a human brain, though, ultimately. It was a prank. It was a cow brain. So, that, but that cool. was what inspired that. <laughs> Ow. Yeah. Well, You're funny. pranksters in college. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I read I read the book with the with the head in the pot. Yeah. And then I read nice. the first size fourteen is not fat, I think. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it felt like even though you know there's a murder in every other book, this book felt a little bit like a little darker. A little bit. <laughs> what size twelve and ready to rock or? Yeah. Yes. Ready to rock. It did. It, it was a little bit darker um, because I actually wanted to explore um, some themes of things that really did happen, actually, that occurred when I was working in um, residence life, which were things such as, um, well, intimate partner abuse, which is you know domestic abuse. I think now they call it intimate partner abuse because um, I don't know domestic abuse sounds a little old timey. I think, um, which is we would have. Um, you know, residents who were students who would be in in relationships, and they would actually be abused. And it wasn't something they would ever come down and talk to us about, but roommates would come down and say, hey, I think my my roommate's getting beat up by her boyfriend. And and I really wanted to discuss that because it's something that I think is happening a lot in – even high school relationships, and it gets a little bit covered up. I know that we hear a lot from in my YA readers sometimes. Um, I'll see on blogs people complaining about, oh, you know, there's so many dead girls on the cover of YA books now. And I'm like, but, you know, uh, the leading cause of injury to women ages 15 to 44 is actually intimate partner abuse. And so that's not something that's wrongly kind of reflected in the literature that we're reading now. It's actually something that's happening, and it doesn't happen in one particular socioeconomic group or 
it happens kind of everywhere, and it happened in at NYU where I worked, and these were kids who quite a few of them were really privileged, but you can get sucked into these relationships where things start happening and you have no control anymore, and a lot of the roommates would come in and say things like, oh, God, you know, I can't understand how she got sucked into this. If my boyfriend ever hit me, you know, I'd punch him in the face right away, and the thing is, you know, these girls who were in these relationships, they didn't punch the guy in the face because... You know, they're afraid of him. I think they would have wanted to. So that's I kind of wanted to write a little bit about that in this book because I saw it so many times and it was so desperately sad and and scary for these girls Um, and some boys, too, I want to point out. So that that is a little bit reflected in Size 12 and Ready to Rock um, and because it actually did happen. There weren't any murders (laughs) when I worked there, but that did happen. So I wanted to write a little bit about that and and also some infertility issues that that might be happening Mm -hmm. in someone's relationship. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Yeah. I won't spoil it either. <laughs> no, but I think it's, you know, I, I often hear from readers who say, you know, it seems like in every book that I read, um, you know, the women who, who want to have a baby, maybe they'll have like a little bit of a problem with infertility. And then by the end, oh, the baby magically appears. But that's, you know, that's not reality. And a lot of people um, who struggle with those issues find other ways to be happy in their lives <laughs> or, you know, just I wanted to explore that a little bit in the book series as well. So that, I wouldn't say they're darker issues, but they're more realistic issues. Not that murder is not realistic, because it does happen too, but it's not something that necessarily happened while I was working at NYU in my dorm. So that may be why it feels a little more realistic. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit more about your experience working at a residence hall at NYU? Well, it was super fun fun most of the time um and there was a lot of uh, a lot of prank playing like i mentioned because it's great to work with young people um people who are kind of starting their lives for the first time as young adults really because this is their first time a lot of in a lot of cases being away from home and but they're living in a kind of a place where they're being a little bit sheltered because I was the assistant manager and then I had a boss who was the assistant director or she was actually the director and then they have resident assistants who are um, people who are getting free room and board and they live on each floor and kind of look out for people so there was some some supervision but not not a whole lot but they always knew they had somebody to come to if there was a problem and so that was our job and um, sometimes they didn't really necessarily want to be called down to our office because maybe they had done something they shouldn't have been doing Um, there's a lot of drinking (laughs) and other things Things. But um, it was great. We, we, I mean, I just worked there for 10 years, obviously, because I loved it. Um, and there was also a lot of free time, because a lot of times they didn't wake up till really late <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> so, so I did a lot of writing at that job. Um, but also there was a lot of administration, administrative stuff, so it was great. I, I, you know, and it was an experience I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. I, I made some great lifelong friends working there. and um, But I got a lot of experience, too, in, in stuff that... Um, you know, I, I sadly there were some suicides and, and things like that because that kind of thing happens at that age. Um, mm-hmm. So I unfortunately experienced that. And sometimes I get a little upset when I read books where people talk about suicide because I know having experienced it and worked with people that that happened to, that it doesn't really happen that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what can you do when you've had to when you have to pack up a kid's belongings for his parents? You know, and you read the actual notes that they write, you know that it's not really the way it is reflected in um, those books that sometimes come out and everybody's like, oh, this book was so great and moving. It's like, you know, it's not really like that, but, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, it's such an emotional time for the students, the first time they're away. And and my boyfriend was an RA for two years, so I can't imagine the experience and the stories you have from working at a residence hall for 10 years. I mean, he has some... He has some funny stories from working as an RA. He has some pretty scary ones too. Yeah, you see everything. Yeah, no, it is. It's and um, I I really value a lot of the relationships that I made there, and it's great to see them graduate and go on to do great things. And some of the people that I worked with are writers themselves now, and we've got some film directors and a lot of actresses. So it's really been fabulous to see them move on. And I actually had one show up at one of my book signings who was one of my favorite residents, and he had a little daughter and a little baby, and I was just like, oh. oh. And he actually, a lot of people who were at the book signing were like, is that Gavin? From size 12, because, um, you know, I, I guess they just thought it was, but, you know, I would never say, but he was so cute. It was just adorable. That must have been so affirming. It was, and he brought me a 12-pack a of Tab, because that was <laughs> a diet soda that I used to drink when I worked there, and now, of course, I'm 
I drank the whole thing when I was on book tour, but now I'm trying to get off the diet soda because Dr. Oz says it's really bad for you. So today's my first day. I have a really bad headache, but I'm I'm making it. I'm going to make it off the diet soda one of these days, ladies. Old turkey. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad, let me tell you. But Dr. Oz says it's okay to drink wine. So in a little while after this book chat, I'm going to <laughs> – maybe I'm a glass of wine while I watch the Olympics. <laughs> Speaking of which, we have to talk about, uh, because I promised I would, uh, Ryan Lochte and what he and I have in common, which is that we were both snubbed by idols when we were starting out in our career. (laughs) It's just, you have to keep it to yourself who it was, but it happens in every business. But it does inspire you to go on and try to be nicer to your fans than that person was. I'm not going to say who it was, just like he doesn't say, (laughs) but it happens. It happens. It happens I I can say my idol, the person who it was... It's not really in the business anymore, so <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, who's laughing now? Uh, I wouldn't. Yeah, well, I would never say that. <laughs> I I'm it. pretty sure probably his his isn't either. <laughs> I hope yeah. he's performing at the Olympics right now. <laughs> um, oh my goodness! Have, all right, back, oh, back okay. on track. Oh no, no, don't worry at all. Um, I have to ask this now. We're getting a bunch of uh, chat room questions. Oh, but- oh no. Well, Melissa from Utah wants to know what your favorite Olympic event is. Now that oh we're- my gosh! I, you know, I, I, you know, I really, obviously, being a, you know, I hate to say this because Michelle Obama said the gymna- gymnastics too. Um, I do love the, I do love gymnastics. I love swimming too, though. And I have to say, I do love the equestrian because I always wanted to have a horse. So I, um, I get a little thrill watching people on the horses, but you yeah. know. I just never got one, and now it seems like I would have to move somewhere outside of Key West, Florida, because you really there's no room for horses here. So yeah. maybe someday. Yeah, someday. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to ask. So Jordan, Tanya, and Heather in the books are all you know pop stars or former pop stars. Did you have any real pop stars in mind when you were writing their characters? You know, I. I am a little obsessed with Britney Spears. I will will admit that I'm fascinated by the whole getting plucked out of kind of obscurity and as a teen or a very young person and then being thrust into stardom and how do you maintain that and what – and even Justin Bieber, if you think about it, um, although he – kind of was, he started on YouTube, but you you know, what is that like growing up in that kind of bubble, especially now with the internet and you never, and the paparazzi and people just observing you, how do you ever get to be kind of a normal person? And then, especially if you're someone whose career, and I wouldn't say this about Justin Bieber, but you know, if you, you maybe don't have so much talent, I'm not talking about Britney, <laughs> but <laughs> What what must that be like if you kind of then get cast aside? And I and I actually don't think that Britney doesn't have talent because I think she really does. But um, it just it must be kind of weird. And I do think that Heather Wells has talent. She she is trying to be a songwriter. But I don't. She even admits in size twelve and ready to rock that she's not the best singer. Tanya mm-hmm. um, Trace is a really really great singer who has an incredible vocal range. I am so sorry because my phone is now um, my other line is going off. Um, oh. And I'm just hanging up on them. It's <laughs> someone who is, uh, it's a congressperson um, who's calling oh. probably to get my vote. Anyway, <laughs> she, um, so she she feels very, I think, inadequate in that way because she realizes that she was very lucky to have what she got, but maybe didn't quite deserve it as much as maybe another person. And so much of that is luck. You know, that you just happen to be in the right place at the right time, and you get this contract, and then suddenly it's all taken away from you. So she feels maybe a little bit, I don't know, that she didn't quite deserve what she got. And now it has all been taken away, and she has to start over. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. She's kind of okay with that. Right. So I don't know if maybe that there's people who've had all that who, I don't know, would, would quite have the wherewithal that she has to do that. Right. Not yeah. that she wasn't brilliant in her day, but I don't know if she even believes that. Well, now, like, after I saw the uh, Sugar Rush video, I mean... You don't think she was brilliant? I don't. I'm saying I think she was extremely brilliant. I had that song in my head for it. I know. No, that's a fantastic song. So I had so much help. Um in uh, writing and, and getting that song off the ground, and I think that the you know the performer is very brilliant. But um, yeah, it was a pop song, 
And she didn't yeah. write it, and so she feels, I think, that she did. She could have done a better job if she had written it herself. Right. Yeah. Because would, you would have ended up putting more of your heart into it. Mm-hmm. If it's something that came from your heart. Um, so some of my favorite characters in the books were some of the, like, the secondary characters, you know, like um, there's Reggie, the drug dealer, in the first couple books, and then there's, um, Magda and the detective. Who are your favorite secondary characters to write? They were so funny. Well, well, thank you. I do. I really have a soft spot in my heart for Gavin, one of the students, um, because he's, you know, I, I think that he's really a little bit in love with Heather. And, she, and I'm not sure that he knows that she's never going to return that love because obviously she's in love with Cooper, who is, you know, my next favorite character. Cooper is the love interest in the story who um, has, I think, always been a little in love with Heather but felt like he couldn't show it because, yeah. you know, she's she's his brother's ex-girlfriend, and that's always yeah. a taboo, I think. So, um, and I think he's he's obviously, you know, my favorite character, but he's, you know, the kind of gruff P.I. that she works for, and, um, you know, she never dreamed that he might like her back, but I think he always did. And um, so those two are my favorite. And I do kind of like writing about the president of the university, who's a little bit of a kook, and yeah. just shows up randomly at really weird times, always dressed inappropriately, which I think is hilarious. So, <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I do, and I really like the um, lady who does the PR, Mamie. Uh, yeah, Mamie Fowler, I think is her name. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Muffy. Yeah, originally her name was Mamie, and I, had to it. <laughs> I always refer to characters by the names that they had originally, and then I had to change. Um, I think she's, you know, she's a little bit southern, and she's very. She has these ideas about how things are supposed to be, and I think it's great. You know, that's just how they are and Heather's always like wow that's okay that's so strange so I I really like those secondary characters and now we have a new character Uh, Heather's finally gotten a boss who hasn't been not to give things away hasn't been killed (laughs) or you know ended up killing anyone or gotten a promotion or anything she finally got a boss that hopefully will stay for a while that she really likes Um, and so hopefully that boss will stick around for a while we'll see I hope so I really liked her a lot yeah yeah, and Cooper is such a dreamboat. You just like he just dreamy. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, he would be. Um, I think he could be probably one of the few. Well, so people always ask me like, who would you have dinner with if you had to have dinner with any of your characters? And mm-hmm. I always think, oh my gosh, you know, it's so weird because I kind of created them. But I would have dinner with Cooper. Like he's yeah. he. I not only would have dinner with him, but he could make me dinner because mm-hmm. I think he would be a good cook. And then if there was a crime that occurred during the dinner, like if there was actually a murder during the meal, he would be great because he could help solve it. So, Oh, yeah. Definitely have Cooper. Yeah. He's, he just strikes me as someone who'd be, you know, good with his hands, but also like <laughs> not, not in, a, in many ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe in a few ways. But, you know, he he's rustic, but he's he can clean right. up nicely. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I agree. He could cook oh. stuff, and oh, he's also well now. And, and well, I don't want to give stuff away, but we know that he might be armed as well. So it's good, right. but, you know, anything because <laughs> he's got his PI license. So yeah. So did did you work at a for a PI? Did I read that? I did. Them? Yes, actually, one of the many temp jobs that I did when I was trying to make money uh, when I moved to New York was that I worked for a private eye. I did not actually know that was the job when I showed up. They were just they would always go, okay, show up at this place, and I showed up, and I had to just do this billing. I had to pull these forms apart and stuff them in envelopes, and then I realized that I was working in <laughs> for a private investigator who actually worked for um, these lawyers. But um, once I figured it out, I was so excited. And he was very, I have to say, he was quite gentlemanly, and he was not unattractive. And he, But he wore a suit, He was, you know, because it was for lawyers, and he had to go do the stuff. So I was always trying to get him to tell me what his cases were about, because I was so delighted to as a mystery lover, of course. So yeah. I was like, well, you know, what, what's this bill for? And who are these people? And he would not tell me a thing. He was so you know, on target about how there was client privilege. And he, I think he was also a little embarrassed because I was a young lady. <laughs> and he, he was probably 20 years older than me, but very, you know, suave, gentlemanly, 20 years older than me. And he was just, oh, no, ma'am. Oh, no, ma'am. He called me ma'am. I couldn't tell you. And, uh, you know, after like a week, I was reassigned to a different office. So 
I think he just was like, get rid of this girl. She asked too many questions. So, and I don't, you know, it never even came up that I wanted to be a writer too, but I think he probably suspected because he was a good detective. So that did not last long, but it was fabulous for the few days that it happened. So yeah, if this is a word of advice. If you are a writer and you ever wanted to work for a detective, ask no questions because they will immediately fire you. <laughs> they do not want writers working for them. They know what's happening in your little writer head. So it was very sad. It was a glorious few days. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like a blast. It was. He wore um, little, like, those loafers. He had shiny loafers. And it was just so not what they show, like, you know, what they show on those P.I. shows. Because he was yeah. super, he was super classy. <laughs> <laughs> and just utterly embarrassed to have me anywhere near him. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if he, if he knows that. Oh, God. I'm sure he doesn't know my name even. He's just like, oh, if anybody ever brought me up, he'd be like, who? Oh, God. Thank God we got rid of that girl. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Grace to the PI world. <laughs> As it should be. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is good. So, Kathy uh, Roberts, a.k.a. Bermuda Onion, she's a blogger who's listening in. She wanted to know what other jobs you've had. Oh, Lord, I've had so many jobs. Because if you want to be a writer, obviously, you have to find other ways to make money, <laughs> unless you get published right away, which did not happen to me. So besides my <laughs> very short career as the assistant to a PI and then my long career working in a dorm at NYU, I was I also worked for Sears as the dry and wet vac mover. <laughs> I had to move dry and wet vacs back and forth across the store while they were remodeling for a while, and that was very, very bad and I had to quit after a week. I also worked at Rack's Roast Beef, which I don't know if anyone even knows that restaurant, but they had them in the Midwest and that only lasted for three days. I had to be the salad bar attendant because I was so bad at doing the baked potatoes, which so people would come in and they'd order a baked potato and they had to have special toppings and that meant I had to pull the baked potatoes out of the oven and they were very hot. And for some reason at this Rack's, they did not want you to use um, oven mitts. I don't know why, but it was just, I don't know, maybe they thought they would catch fire. And I, my fingers just got very, very burnt, so I got moved off. Also, I didn't put the toppings on in the right order. Oh. Um, yeah, there was an order you were supposed to do it. So I got moved to salad bar attendant. And then I'm not even going to tell you, I shouldn't have said the name of the restaurant, but I'm not going to tell you what happens at the salad bar. So <laughs> those of you who've worked at salad bars and fast food restaurants know. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, I mean, yeah. There's a special stuff that you put on the lettuce at night that makes it go back to the right color. That's all. It's not It's not natural. But I would still eat it. It's fine. And actually, this was back in the 80s, so they probably don't use it anymore. Oh, God. It's probably just in Indiana. Let's see, where else? Um, let's move on to another topic. Okay. I mean, even even if I knew what they were putting on salad, I'd probably still eat it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I ate it and I was fine, but um, they don't I, they don't want me there. And they didn't want me after a while. I wore this really cute green polyester outfit though, and it was kind of cute. I I thought I looked cute. It looked like a little elf. But you know, later on, I did do some like paralegal stuff and more serious work that um, helped me in my later career as being a, of being a writer. So. Mm -hmm. That, I, I would only say, was more character building. But I think if you want to be a writer, it's good to get kind of a, a vast series of jobs because then you have stuff to write about. Yeah. Because, of, you know, it's character building and, you know, you meet a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can write about them. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, I, yeah. I would definitely recommend getting a lot of different jobs and then observing the people at them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think working in food service, too. I mean, I think it's such a good experience for Absolutely. Too. But try to get one where you get tips, because there were no tips at Rack's Roast Beef. That's not a good situation for tips. <laughs> yeah. um, so, moving on to another. So, you mentioned this is the first Heather Wells book in a few years, and you've just been on the road. You've just been yes. reading tons of fans. What has the responses been from people who've been waiting for this next book? Well, it was really positive. You know, I took a few years off because I was writing the Ali Finkel series, um, Ali Finkel's Rules for Girls, which is for younger readers. It was my first series that they call middle grade, which means it's for readers like eight, eight and up. I always thought middle grade meant middle school, but I was incorrect about that. Um, so a lot of these readers who, um, you know, were waiting for the Heather Wells 
series, the next book, brought their Ali Finkel readers to the book signing. So that was incredible. It was so fun because so we had readers who were, you know, as young as seven and eight, um, and, you know, nine, ten. And then we had readers of the Heather Wells series who were, you know, not eight and up. They were adult readers. Um, but then we also had readers of the um, Abandoned series, which I've also been working on, which is a new uh, teen YA paranormal series. So I was taking a little break from the Heather Wells series to work on, on those books. So it was really fun because we had readers from kind of every age range, um, mm-hmm. which meant the line, we had like 500 people in line at a couple uh-huh. of the events. So it was kind of great on the one hand, but I kind of felt bad because there were so many people in line. It was so hot everywhere that we went, but the events were inside, so I think it was okay. But um, that was really, really fun. And so I think it's great how we've kind of got you know, multiple generations now, Um, because people who started out reading my books, The Princess Diaries, which I, you know, they came out in, wow, I think like the year 2000, Mm -hmm. and another series, the Mediator series, which is also a teen paranormal, also came out that year, um, which is unbelievable, you know, so people who started reading those books back then, some of them have kids now, so it was kind of funny to see these people who, um, you know, really in a way kind of grew up on my books, which doesn't make me feel old at all. (laughs) <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I did have one reader who's like, this is, you know, my granddaughter. And oh. I, I don't even want to talk about it because I'm really not that old. But it was kind of hilarious. Um okay. So that was really fun, and to get that many, that kind of response, and people who were that excited about it was really great. And um, just having this new book in the series that has really captivated so many readers' um, imagination was really fun. I, no one actually went out and bought that dress, though, that's on the cover of Size 12 and Ready to Rock. I couldn't even find it. So we've got to find where they got that dress, because that dress is fabulous. It's fabulous. I've seen... Similar things, yeah. like it, not in this color though. Yeah. And actually, I saw she wasn't wearing a dress, but there was a blogger last week who did a photo shoot inspired by the cover, and she had sequin pants on. Oh my gosh, I need to get that. You know, we went through so many dresses because we knew yeah. that we wanted to have a really fabulous dress on the cover, and we wanted the reader to, or Heather, we wanted her to look really happy. Um, and so we tried many different dresses, but that one, the minute we saw it, we knew that was obviously the one because it was just so, um, you know, it was just so sparkly and exciting. So. And I hate, I'm the kind of reader, I mean, the kind of writer who turns in everything a little bit late. Some would say a lot late. So we actually had the cover before I finished the book. So it was very convenient because then in the last scene of the book when she's, she's actually wearing the dress. So it was great because I was like, okay, I'm going to write that dress in. So I knew she was going to have this big scene where she wears this great dress, but I didn't know exactly what the dress would look like. And then we had the cover. So it was great. Yeah. I not admit that. But everybody knows it, so it's okay. It always, it's been happening to me since like 2003. So I just, I've given up at this point. I'm like, it's kind of convenient because I can just then write the cover into the book. So yeah. it works out. Yeah, it happens more often than one would think. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's good to know. So, so, yeah, we have a bunch of questions in the chat room, and then we have a few people who are calling in, too. Oh. Uh, so I, I guess we'll start with the people that are um, that are calling that are calling in. Um Let's try that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to try to unmute someone named Diana who has a question for you. Okay. Diana, are you there? Hi, yes. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Meg. This is Diana from San Francisco. Hi, Diana. How are you? I want to wish you a happy Make Habit Day, first of all. Why, thank you. Same to you. And I actually have two questions for you. The first one is, um, are we going to see more of Cooper's hilarious twin sisters in the next book? <laughs> I think we are. I love them. And, um, yeah, we definitely are. They're going to be back, actually, because in the next book, which is called Size 12 is the New Black, I it's going to involve Heather and Cooper's wedding, finally. And, obviously, they cannot have a wedding without Cooper's family. So we will Excellent. definitely see them. Great. And my second question is, um, have your cats, Henrietta and Jem, done anything um, especially <laughs> funny or weird recently that you can share with us? <laughs> well, we actually, I was just away on my book tour, and then we traveled a little bit to see some family. So they were on their own while we were gone. So they have been so excited that we've been back. They have glommed onto us. And we've really not been allowed to leave their presence 
since we got back. So it's a little annoying. Like I was just eating um, my lunch, a turkey sandwich downstairs, and the cat just jumped into my lap and started trying to eat the sandwich, which is really, I mean, it's really weird, I think, for a cat. I don't know. Yeah. Cats are supposed to eat turkey. So then my husband's like, get her off. But it was so cute that I couldn't. So we need to start filming them, I think. And then the other cat, she's actually, I just had to lock her out because she was crying so loud. I didn't want you guys to hear this oh. constant cat crying during the uh radio show so yeah that i mean i don't know if cute is really the word <laughs> and they're very expressive they're pretty so thank adorable you for asking about them oh you're you guys welcome are awesome thank you and thanks, thanks diana so much. bye thanks. diana you're welcome okay and so now we have a question from lexi i'm going to unmute lexi right now um she wants to know some advice for people getting into the writing business lexi are you there yeah i'm there i'm here <laughs> hi lexi Hi, happy my Cabot Day. Why, thank you. Same to you. So you I, want some advice on uh, getting into the writing profession? Mm-hmm. Okay, so where have you finished a book yet? Uh, kind of. I've written a novella. Okay. Um, well, it, you know, I think it's probably kind of, it's a little hard to get a novella published. I think most, Mm -hmm. most publishers are looking for, um, a standard length novel, which would probably be about if it's, um, I think, is it adult fiction or YA? Uh, it's young adult. You know, probably around 50,000 words. So if you could make it a little longer, (laughs) um, (laughs) just, you know, add some padding to it, make it about 50,000 words, which would be, I don't know, around 250 pages, maybe 300 pages. Um, not that your novella is isn't you know publishable, but but if you want to go with like a traditional publisher, they usually look for something around that long, and it's just hard to get a novella published because it's kind of a weird yeah. length, um, unless you can make it maybe be a chapter in another you know it could be like a three book, you know if you did like three I don't know, but so what I usually do is I what I did was I grabbed a book called the Jeff Herman's Guide to Getting an Agent Editor and Publisher. And I still think that that's a really good guide on getting published. It has a lot of great, for instance, it would tell you, you know, the word lengths that people are looking for and all of the publishers that pay. I still think the best way to try to get published is to, you know, have someone pay you for your book rather than you try to publish it on Amazon and then, you know, you pay them. Um, So that's what I did, and I still advise people to do that. But I know the publishing industry has changed a lot since I tried to get published, and a lot of people now are are getting their own stuff published on, um, you know, Smashwords or or all these different publishing sites. Um, I think the best way still to me is to get an agent and then have your agent try to get it published for you. And the way that I got an agent was that I got that book, and I just wrote to every agent in that book and asked them, you know, told them about my book and told them who I was, and they all rejected me. And then I wrote them again, and they rejected me again. I did that for, like, a few years until finally one of them was like, hey, you know what? That book sounds great. I want to take you on. Um, And now she's still my agent, and that's how I got published. And, I, you know, I think it just takes a lot of perseverance and don't give up and keep writing. Write other books. Don't, like, think – I mean, I have a ton of books that I wrote that never got published because – probably they were really bad. I'm not saying yours is, but I know the first ones I wrote maybe needed a little more work. So I just kept working on them, and I worked on other books. I just think, you know, I think it's really, it's it's a great dream to have, to get published. It's so much better than, like, buying lottery tickets, you know, because there's so many other people buying lottery tickets, but you have written something, you have a great product that you wrote and you created, and I think you should be able to sell it because you love it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> It's, it's such what? Advice. What's the problem? <laughs> right? I think you can do it. So have you tried any of the stuff that I'm talking about? Uh, Not yet. All right. <laughs> so. Uh, well, you've got your advice. advice. Your uh, stories are my inspiration for writing. Oh, my God. You are so awesome. I think you can do it. I would just recommend maybe pat- making your story a little longer so it's a little more, I hate to say it, but like a little more commercially saleable because novellas are a little tough. But you never know. Maybe there's somebody out there who would who would want a novella, and just make it like a few more ten thousand words longer, okay? Okay. And then get All right, the thank look you. up jeffherman.com. dot com. All right. Good. Okay. Thanks, Lexi. Thank you. All right. And so we have a few. I want to make sure. I want to try to get as many in as possible. Um, Cabot stuff wants to ask. Um, she's in the chat room. Um, she wants to know how long it took you to write Size 12 and Ready to Rock. 
Oh, how long it took me to write Size 12 and Ready to Rock? It took me, wow, I don't know. I mean, it took quite a few months to get the first draft, and then it got returned to me because I always get, you know, I have a a great editor, Carrie Farron, and she read it over, and she she didn't have a ton of suggestions, but she had a few. And so then um, I did the second draft, and it got copy edited. It was probably, I mean, Every time you turn something in, it's a year before it gets turned around. So I would say at least four to five months for the first draft and then another two months for the second. And then it went to, you know, to, to what, the, what do they call it, production. So, um, and it was very late. And I, you know, I was naughty about that one. So, um, but the idea for it um, I've had for a while, I just kind of tweaked it. And now I've got to get started on the next Heather Wells book, um, Size 12 is the New Black, I think is the title we're going with, and that is going to be out this time next year. And by getting started on it, I literally mean <laughs> I have to get started on it. So um, I'm going to be working on that very soon. Take, maybe take a little break. Yeah. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will be excited. A few people have asked what you're working on now, and so... Yeah. Well, I'm actually finishing up um, Awaken, which is the third book in the uh, Abandoned Trilogy, and then I'm going to get started on Size 12. Is the new black. (laughs) Um, Someone, uh, Chaos is a friend of mine, that's the username, they want to know if you have any more books planned in the Queen of Babel series. Oh, my gosh, that is a question I've been getting a lot on this tour. And, you know, I really do not, although I do have another book planned in the um, Boy Trilogy, which is an email book. People have been asking a lot about that. I used to do a series of books that were all told in emails and texts and uh, receipts (laughs) from restaurants and stuff. So I am going to do another one of those, which I realize is not answering your question about the Queen of Babel, but um, it's kind of going to be a sequel to those books so that's the only oh and i have a sequel plan to the mediator series um there's gonna be a seventh book in that but i have not started it yet so that's just to let people know what is coming up in the future and i I have some other things kind of brewing but i'm not allowed to talk about them so just to let you know but queen of babel is one that i really kind of am happy with where it ended for now but that could change we'll see um, we have a question. Um, what do you like to do in your spare time? Oh, my gosh. I never get any spare time. <laughs> but when I do, I love to read. I love reading mysteries right now. I do sometimes read other things right now. I'm reading um, – I just read a great book that Whitney at Schuler Books gave me called Bad Monkeys by Matt Ruff. That was great. Um, it was kind of a mystery. It was kind of sci-fi, too. That was good. And um, I also love watching TV, and I hate to say it. I watch kind of bad TV. I like to watch some really bad reality shows. Um, I have witnessed the housewives of all, (laughs) every housewife, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, I like really junky shows. Like I really love those ones on Discovery Fit and Health Channel. I don't know if those of you who get that channel, but anything that's about a medical dilemma, that someone if anyone has a 200-pound tumor, I will watch that. I will watch anyone have any kind of excess skin removed. <laughs> and anyone who um, has to have any kind of hoarding eliminated from their home or an intervention. I love anything like that, and I don't know why it's horrible, and I know I shouldn't watch it, but I do. I also like toddlers who wear tears. <laughs> That's horrible, too. And I don't like to admit that, but I do also like all those shows I mentioned, um, Rizzoli and Isles from mm-hmm. the awesome Tess Garretson. I love those books, and I love the show based on those books, and I like everything that on, on the USA Network. For instance, um, <laughs> Covert Affairs. Oh, yeah. and Franklin. No, Franklin and Bash, I think, is on TNT. But, oh, my gosh, The Closer. I'm not Don't get me started, okay? <laughs> I watch way too much TV, but I'm trying to get fit right now for health reasons. So I, I've been working on my treadmill and not drinking diet soda. So those are the answers. <laughs> <laughs> it is horrendous, and I do not like it. But I've been told I have to do it. <laughs> only because my clothes don't fit. That's the only reason. <laughs> no other reason. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's easier than buying a whole new wardrobe. I know, exactly, yeah. So it's, I'm not going to buy all new clothes. So, yes, go on. What, who else have we got? All right, so Call there's the someone author. calling in um, named Kriya. She has a quick question for you. I'm just going to unmute her. Kriya, are, are you there? Yes. Uh, first, may I have a little squeeze since I wasn't expecting to get on this soon? Hi, I'm so happy to talk to you. 
Radio. Thank you. And I have loved seeing you in Miami when you came for the abandoned trip. Oh, um, hi. And my question is, I was reading um, Every Boy's Got One, and okay. the actor mentioned that he who must not be named in your wedding. <laughs> uh, part of the reason why you've never written a wedding in a book, because you've never uh, had the plan one, but if the wedding goes on in an exercise 12 book, um, what made you change your mind? Well, I've I've been to weddings, so I I have attended them, and I I've had family members who who have been married, and I do you know I love that show Say Yes to Your to the Dress, so I have to admit that um and you know my twentieth anniversary is coming up next year, so I have already informed he who shall not be named that I want Randy to come to our house and throw a gigantic uh, wedding for us, but he has very reluctant to do that. But no, I think it would be really fun to um, have Heather get married. But, you know, who knows if it will actually be pulled off. So we're assuming that she will end up getting married. And I, I hope she will. Um, but, no, I, I, I've had a lot of friends get married, so I've, I've experienced it. Um, you know, I think that some people are really blessed and have great families who all get along, and some people don't. And so I wanted to put my family – my dad actually had cancer during the time that we were going to get married, and so I didn't want to put my family through a, a you know, a stressful wedding. So we didn't – we eloped. But actually when we got back from eloping, we had a big party at my house. So we did kind of have a wedding Um but it wasn't a big wedding at the plaza like Heather Wells may be going to have. So um, we're going to look forward to hopefully that coming off without any dead bodies. But who <laughs> knows? It is Heather Wells. So something very tragic may be brewing, not actually in death dorm, but possibly at the Plaza Hotel where Princess Mia and her grandmother used to meet for princess lessons. Who knows? Maybe Grandmare. <laughs> there will be a crossover. And she'll show up dead. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it probably won't be Grandmare dead at Heather Wells' wedding, but maybe someone. <laughs> but thank you very much for asking about it. <laughs> Not at all. That's a great question. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. That's so funny. We've gotten a lot of uh, questions about Mia and... Uh, oh, Mrs. yes. Well, Mia, yeah. That, I've had a lot of questions about Mia because, of course, she, um, you know, she ended up living a little bit happily ever after in the last book of the Princess Diaries, but she was only graduating from high school. And, of course, in the Princess Diaries movie, Royal Engagement, which was not based on any of my books, just some the characters from the book, mm-hmm. um, she almost gets married, but she doesn't. And so, um, you know, there's still room for a book. And, of course, since Kate Middleton and Prince William got married, people have been asking. So, I, you know, you, I, you never know. There could be a book about them, too. So I think that that could happen definitely in the future. Um, who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, my gosh. I have so many. And um, my favorite author um my favorite book actually that i read like when i'm really sad is called Com- cold comfort farm and it's a book by a woman named stella gibbons and it's just it's a funny um kind of book about an orphan who goes to fix her family that she has left over after her parents died and it's actually a great movie if people have ever seen it um starring um oh my gosh i can't believe her name is completely <laughs> escaping me she's in the okay back in sale so it's set in like the 1930s and it's just a very funny kind of satire book. Um, So that's really my favorite book. I love all of Jane Austen, too. Every author has to say that. I also love an author named Mary Stewart, who writes these really great uh, romantic suspense books that are kind of set in the 1950s and 60s, and they're kind of um, just beautifully written little pearls, I think, of them as as these little romantic suspense books, but they're very old fashioned and people still smoke in them. <laughs> the heroine always has a cigarette and a, you know, a, a glass of gin. So <laughs> after she's had a big, a big astonishing incident happen when someone tries to run her down in an automobile. So those are great. And I love um, mysteries too, as I said. So I'll pretty much read anything that has um, any kind of dead body, but there needs to be a romance too. So that's why I love uh, the Mary Stewart books. But um, I love Robert B. Parker who wrote the Spencer series who passed away. So I've been rereading those and, and they are very much set in the days that they were written. So the ones you read from the 1970s, he wears these like outrageous pantsuits, and you just can't believe it. But you know they're great. And so um, I, I will pretty much read anything though that anyone hands to me, um, and, and enjoy it for the most part. I, you know I'm not so into nonfiction. I really like fiction. I don't. Yeah. Really, I don't really want to read like the biography of politicians for the most part. It's not yeah. interesting to me. 
there's, there probably aren't enough dead bodies. <laughs> there probably are, but they don't write about them enough. <laughs> So, um, and I'm just trying to think of what I, I really read some great books lately that I was talking a little bit about. Um, I read a great book called uh, Witness the Night by Kishwar Desai, which is, she's an Indian author. That's a great mystery. And I read a great book called Bent Road by Lori Roy uh, that just won the Edgar for Best uh, New Mystery. So she, that was fabulous. And I recommend that to people. So we have just about uh, five minutes left. So I want to take two more questions from the chat room. Um, let's see, which was, where was this? oh, uh, Larissa wants to know if anyone, this is another Princess Diaries question, if anyone inspired you to write Lily for the Princess Diaries? <laughs> well, yes, actually, you know, there were two people who kind of inspired Lily. Um, the first one is, I have a couple best friends who are a lot like Lily. Um, they're just really funny, great kind of strong women, um, neither of whom recognize themselves. They, I had them read the books, and not, never, they never got <laughs> there, Lily. And there's another, um, there was a very funny show that used to be on in Manhattan when I lived there, um, and there was a girl who had her own public access show, and it would come on, and she was just outrageously funny. I don't think she meant to be. She was very serious. <laughs> And um, that kind of that was a little bit the base of Lily's show, and um, so that you know sometimes when you're just sitting around and you and public access, I don't know if they they don't really have public access anymore because there's cable, everything's cable. I guess everything's public access now. But she was just hilarious, so that was a little bit the basis of Lily, um, and so that yeah, she was kind of based a little bit on that too. So that's that's Lily, and um, <laughs> they did a good job in the Disney movie actually of kind of. Well, they based it on my book, but <laughs> I thought that Heather Matarazzo just did a fabulous job um, playing Lily in the in the movies. I thought she was so great too. She's, she's always great. She's great in everything. Yeah. Um, and so one more question. Um, you've talked about some TV and books that you like, but Melissa is wondering what movies do you like? Oh, what movies do I like? You know, I love everything i really am not that discerning about you know i don't want to watch those kind of long talky movies i do like a little bit of action and obviously some romance and a little mystery um i have not seen the new batman movie i have an appointment to go see it on sunday and um because i've been away and i was invited to go see it with some people on tour which was very nice of them but i had to get an early flight the next morning so i need to see that and have not seen the new spider-man movie because i've just i've been behind i've been out on the road so um I'm a little behind in all that, but I'm very excited to go. So um, I'm trying to think. But I, saw, I saw Magic Mike, and let me tell you, that was a very excellent experience. Oh. Um, although it did make me a little sad towards the end. Not for Mike, though, because he, you know, um, I won't give away the ending, but I did enjoy it very much. And um, I think that I'm going to enjoy my appointment to see uh, – Batman and uh, Spider-Man, which I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I go see most of my movies now with my extraordinarily uh, outrageous gay hairdresser. He is so fantastic. We went to see Magic Mike together because my husband's just not interested. So yeah, yeah. We go and we have the best time. So we saw that. And we see everything. And then people don't want to sit near us because we laugh so hard. And we have the best time. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the best way to see the movies, in my opinion, because, you know, we basically have the same uh, kind of opinion on all, on all the guys. <laughs> yeah. So it's fabulous. Um, but, yeah, and I'm very excited uh, to go see what else is coming out. I don't know. I'm, I'll see it all eventually. Yeah. But it takes Not a little a- while for things to work their way down to the Florida Keys. So. Yeah. Eh, you guys yeah. have been so awesome. Thank you for all these fabulous questions. This yeah, is like talking to a bunch of my best girlfriends <laughs> and guy friends. Well, did you have anything else you wanted to say, Meg, before we wrap things up? Um, just to let you know, if you go to MegCabot.com, you can uh, find a link to get all of the size 12 books uh, at a super size uh, discount summer price, ebooks only. And um, we're very excited to have everybody kind of follow Heather's adventures um, as she continues on her quest to find justice and put all the criminals in jail. Even though that's not really her job, because she's supposed to be, you know, the assistant manager of a dorm. Well, I don't know, you know. But I like kind of living through her vicariously. Oh yeah, that's yeah. And you took right. the words right out of my mouth. All the ebooks there. The first three are just four ninety nine, and then size twelve to ready to rock. That ebook is seventy seven ninety nine. Special um, size twelve sale. Size twelve days of summer. Yes. As you, yeah, as you said. Um, 
Well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Meg. Thank you to everyone who listened in, who was in the chat room, and to anyone who's listening later. It's been so much fun talking to you about this, and you have such a legion of fans, and I know they were really appreciative of your time tonight. Thank you so much. It's been really fun, and um, I'll see you guys all online or possibly um, at the next Size 12 tour. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.